is Edward Mendelssohn. He's professor of English and comparative literature at the Lionel Trilling and the Lionel Trilling Professor in Humanities at Columbia University. Prior to joining Columbia in 1981, he taught at Yale and Harvard. Edward Mendelssohn is a native New Yorker who went to a very elite and competitive high school, Stuyvesant High School, uh, a school famous for its emphasis of science and mathematics. He then graduated from, from the University of Rochester uh, and then took his PhD at Johns Hopkins. In response to a question during an interview that I read about several years ago, he indicated that while growing up, he intended to be a biologist or perhaps a doctor in a family tradition of doctors. But he then discovered that he enjoyed thinking, of th enjoyed thinking about books more than thinking about a uh, scientific laboratory. Perhaps this was an early indication of versatility. Sometimes I wonder if I should have made a similar change. <laughs> but it's clear that Dr. Mendelssohn made the right choice because he's done very well with books. He's chiefly interested in 19th and 20th century literature, uh, formal and social aspects of poetry and narrative and biographical criticism. He's an Auden specialist and is W.H. Auden's literary, literary executor. His books include Later Auden, which was a sequel to Early Auden, uh, <laughs> and he's published five volumes the first five volumes of a comprehensive edition of and selections from Auden's poems and prose. His other books testify to his versatility. They include, one, The Things That Matter, what seven classic novels have to say about the stages of life, and second, uh, Moral Agents, Eight Twentieth Century American Writers. He's also published annotated editions of novels by Hardy, Bennett, Meredith, Wells, and Trollope. His essays and reviews have appeared in the New York Review of Books, London Review of Books, the New York Times Book Review, as well as in many other journals and collections. And if that's not enough, he also writes about computers, music, and the visual arts. His essay today is titled, Why Odysseus Was Right About Persons. Dr. Mendelssohn. Thank you. Uh, before we begin, I, I finished writing this on Monday, and I haven't changed it in response to the events of the past few days. If anything, perhaps it seems to me, I hope, uh, even more sharply focused on the present climate than it was when I wrote it. So about W.H. Auden, he once began a talk to a distinguished gathering like this one by saying, if I am inaudible, please do not raise your hands because I am also nearsighted. <laughs> now, now, to begin, here are two very different quotations from the Odyssey. The first is spoken by Odysseus when he has returned home to Ithaca at the end of 10 years of wandering following the Greek victory in the nine-year Trojan War. Odysseus is disguised as a beggar because his house has been taken over by the suitors who hope to marry his wife, Penelope. And in that disguise, he speaks to Penelope for the first time in two decades. And this is how he addresses her. I'm using Robert Fitzgerald's vivid rendering. My lady, never a man in the wide world should have a fault to find with you. Your name has gone out under heaven like the sweet honor of some God-fearing king who rules in equity over the strong. His black lands bear both wheat and barley fruit trees laden bright, new lambs at lambing time, and the deep sea gives great hauls of fish by his good strategy so that his folk fare well. My second quotation from the Odyssey is spoken by the shade of the dead king Agamemnon, when Odysseus, who is still alive, encounters Agamemnon's shade in the realm of the dead. Agamemnon led the Achaeans, loosely what we now call the Greeks, in the siege of Troy, and after he came home to Argos, his wife Clytemnestra plotted with her lover Aegisthos to murder him. And this is what the dead Agamemnon says about Clytemnestra, his wife. 
Great God, I thought my children and my slaves at least would give me welcome, but that woman plotting a thing so low defiled herself and all her sex, all women yet to come, even those few who may be virtuous. And a few lines later, Agamemnon tells Odysseus to be wary even of Penelope because, Agamemnon says, the day of faithful wives is gone forever. So here are two ways of thinking about what it means to be a human being. For Agamemnon, his wife Clytemnestra isn't really a person. She's a member of the category women, and he takes it for granted that what she did defiles all members of that category, born or unborn, whatever their individual merits might be, and also that her acts determine the acts of all other women. As he says, the day of faithful wives is gone forever. He doesn't ask whether Clytemnestra might have had uniquely personal reasons for killing him that had to do with his own personal acts. Homer doesn't spell out these reasons, but Aeschylus, in his uh, tragedy Agamemnon, expands on them in detail. For one thing, Agamemnon sacrificed his and Clytemnestra's daughter Iphigenia so that his fleet could sail to Troy to recover another woman, Helen, for his brother Menelaus, when he does his measure the value of his daughter against the value of Helen and decides to, to sacrifice his daughter. For another thing, he brought back with him the captive Trojan princess Cassandra. Captive women are very important to Agamemnon in Homer as in Aeschylus, and he paraded Cassandra in front of Clytemnestra when he returned. Agamemnon doesn't think about this. As far as he's concerned, the only relevant fact about his own murder is that he was murdered by a woman and a wife. Clytemnestra is merely a particularly bad example of a couple of generally bad categories. In the Iliad, where Agamemnon is alive, and in the Odyssey, where he's dead, Agamemnon can't stop himself from talking about women as a class or a group about what women are like, what one woman's relative worth is compared to some other woman's relative worth. Near the start of the Iliad, Agamemnon says that he values the captive woman Chryseis higher than he values his wife Clytemnestra because Chryseis is equal or superior to Clytemnestra in height, mind, and skill, all of which are measurable objective qualities that make it possible to compare one woman to another. These are data. Odysseus, on the other hand, never thinks about what kind of woman Penelope is. He thinks about what kind of person she is. He doesn't praise her as the finest, the most faithful, the most virtuous example of the category women, which is how later centuries, who seem not to have read the way Odysseus thinks about these things, the way in which later centuries tend to praise her. Not at all. He praises her for being like someone else, some God-fearing king like someone who is also very different from herself. She herself is not a king, so in his mind, she doesn't fit into any category at all. At one point in Odysseus's wanderings, the goddess Calypso, who wants to marry him and give him immortality, asks how he can possibly prefer Penelope to her, because Calypso says, I'm taller than she is. Goddesses, as a category, are immeasurably superior to women as a category. Odysseus responds that he understands all this, but he explains that nonetheless he longs for his home, diplomatically changing the subject so that he doesn't need to say that he prefers Penelope as a person. Calypso, by the way, though she is measurably superior to Penelope in every way, literally bores Odysseus to tears. He spends every day on Calypso's island sitting by the shore and weeping. Your name, Odysseus says to Penelope when he returns, has gone out under heaven like the sweet honor of some God-fearing king who rules in equity over the strong. Your fame, that is, your personal glory, your unique reputation, that unique reputation that the great male warriors fight to achieve in the Iliad, it's hers, uniquely and personally. And Homer is very pointedly here likening Penelope to Odysseus himself. As Homer keeps reminding us, Odysseus is a God-fearing king who rules in equity over the strong. For Odysseus, Penelope and the just king are related by analogy. They are like each other, not by a comparison in which he or she are better than or equal to or worse than the other, as women are for Agamemnon. Agamemnon can't even think of Clytemnestra as having her own personal name. She is merely she, that woman. Incidentally, Virgil, when he was composing the Aeneid, was an extraordinarily attentive reader of Homer 
And he portrayed in the Aeneid exactly that God-fearing king who rules in equity over the strong, who, as Odysseus says, is like Penelope. Only in the Aeneid, that king is, in fact, a woman. It's Dido, ruling justly in Carthage, before the gods conspire to poison her with the infatuated love for Aeneas that destroys her, and that gives Rome an excuse for destroying Carthage a few centuries later. That, by the way, is one of the stories that Virgil tells about a theme very much like the one I've been talking about in Homer, that theme being the conflict between unique persons like Dido and collective things like the Roman Empire, but that, that is another story. To go back to Penelope, Penelope, as you might expect, shares Odysseus's way of thinking about unique persons. Exactly as he values her as a unique person, so she values him as a unique person. After he defeats the suitors, she is not willing to accept him as her husband Odysseus, and not someone else disguised as Odysseus, until she can be certain that he does not merely match Odysseus by objective measures such as looks and strength, but that he uniquely and inwardly is Odysseus. And he is able to prove this to her by having private memories that no one but Odysseus could have had. For Penelope, it is not sufficient that the man sitting in her bedroom claiming to be her husband looks like Odysseus, talks like Odysseus, has a scar on his thigh like Odysseus, kills suitors like Odysseus. As she says, an imposter or a god could fake all of these things. He proves that he is Odysseus by knowing something that he alone knows, that the bed he built for his and Penelope's marriage cannot be moved because he built it from the trunk of an olive tree still rooted in the ground. Penelope accepts Odysseus because he alone shares with her the intimate private secret of their bed. What's at stake in the contrast that Homer draws between, on the one hand, Penelope and Odysseus, and on the other hand, Agamemnon, is, I think, also at the heart of the great ethical and political arguments of the past century, because those arguments are very much concerned with how much we think about human beings as unique individual persons, and how much we think about them as members of categories or as replaceable units in some hierarchy of power or status. Both ways of thinking about human beings are, of course, true. Everyone is both a unique person and one among many citizens. Everyone is partly a unique self, partly an impersonal product of a culture shared by vast crowds of other people. But what Odysseus and Penelope both know is that it matters a great deal which of these alternatives you focus on, the individual or the culture, the person or the category, which one has your deepest emotional and moral loyalty. What is also at stake here, I think, are some of the great ethical issues that the coming century is likely to face. The ways in which human beings will conduct their lives at a time when governments and corporations increasingly make automated use of information about everyone that they gather and measure and process on their centralized servers. What Agamemnon applies to women is, though of course he doesn't use this specific word, an algorithm. The algorithm takes into account various measurable numerical factors like height, beauty, and skill, and Agamemnon prefers whichever woman the algorithm tells him is the superior one. I think Homer knew exactly what he was doing when he portrayed Agamemnon getting himself killed, partly because he relied on something like an algorithm, while Odysseus and Penelope find mutual love and happiness, partly because they didn't. One question that Homer takes seriously is the question of how much individual persons and their unique personal choices affect the course of events. Interestingly enough, the Iliad takes one view of the question, and the Odyssey takes an almost entirely opposite view. First, the Iliad. In the opening lines of the poem, Homer invokes the muse to sing in him the story of Achilles' anger and its consequences. And by telling the story to show how, I'm quoting, the will of Zeus was accomplished. In the Iliad, that is, what happens fulfills the will of the gods, not what human beings choose. But at moments much later in the poem, the gods declare that not even they, the gods, get to choose what happens. Matters of life and death, they say, were decided by some impersonal fate or destiny and decided a long time ago. Those matters are not in the hands of human beings acting and choosing now, and they're not even in the hands of gods acting and choosing now. But the Odyssey says exactly the opposite of what the Iliad says. The very first thing that anyone says in the Odyssey, and it's spoken by Zeus himself, is that human beings are always blaming the gods for their misery when it's their own folly that gives them misery beyond anything ordained by fate. Human beings are themselves responsible for what happens to them, not the gods, 
and what human beings do now decides what happens to them later. Zeus explains it. Look at Aegisthus, he says. We told him not to go to bed with Clytemnestra. We told him not to murder Agamemnon. We told him what the consequences would be. We even sent down the messenger god Hermes to warn him. Aegisthus knew exactly what would happen to him if he murdered Agamemnon, if he did what we warned him not to do. We gave him good advice, Zeus says, but would Aegisthus listen? No, and now he's dead, and justly so. That is what Zeus says. And the goddess Athena answers, so all perish who do as he has done. This seems to me an astonishing moment. Suddenly, after everything that was said about them in the Iliad, the gods aren't playing favorites or watching destiny play itself out, and they certainly aren't thinking that one woman's act defiles all other women. Zeus and Athena are describing a moral universe where your own free actions lead to the consequences of those actions. So all perish who do as he has done. The consequences are inevitable, the gods can't change the consequences, but the actions are entirely the work of personal choice at this moment. This is the kind of morality that is not a set of rules or prescriptions, it's something like the laws of physics or chemistry, descriptive laws of physics or chemistry. If you act in a certain way, then certain consequences follow. Ludwig Wittgenstein wrote that ethics can't be a way of talking about the world, it's not an attitude, it's not a set of moral opinions. Ethics, he said, must be, and I'm quoting, a condition of the world like logic. What all this means is that, in the, what all this means in the Odyssey is that the existence of individual persons thinking and acting for themselves, whether for better or for worse, that all this is inseparable from the existence of a morally coherent universe. And to the degree that you are a unique autonomous person, you are more likely to perceive the universe as a morally coherent place. If you're a non-person, a member of a crowd, a mere product of your culture, then you won't see that moral logic. You'll imagine that it's merely a set of moralizing attitudes or arbitrary rules, and you'll decide that the world is in fact best interpreted according to the data by applying objective, measurable algorithms. Agamemnon values in women measurable attributes like height and skill. In himself, he values another measurable attribute, which is his social status. He's always worrying whether he's going to lose status because someone else has a measurably more desirable captive or a measurably more valuable storehouse of plunder or measurably more power among his armies. Now, Homer seems to have some very strong views about the difference between thinking about oneself as a person and thinking about oneself in a status hierarchy, a status hierarchy where it's not who you are that matters, but where you stand by comparison with others in the same hierarchy. Near the start of the Iliad, Zeus sends a false dream to Agamemnon, telling him that he can conquer Troy today. And when Agamemnon tells the dream, that oily sycophant Nestor says, well, had anyone else had this dream, we would say it was a lie. But he who had the dream is the man who, and the phrasing is very interesting, who declares himself the first among the Achaeans, declares himself the first among the Greeks, so let's do as he says. In other words, if your status is high enough and visible enough, if you're not only the first among the Greeks, but you declare yourself the first among the Greeks, then what you say must be treated as true. But of course, Agamemnon's dream is in fact false. 20,000 lines later, near the end of the poem, Zeus sends a true dream to Priam, king of the Trojans, telling him to go to the Greek camp and to ransom his son's body from Achilles. Priam's wife begs him not to do anything so reckless, but Priam answers, do not hinder me. Had anyone else, even a soothsayer or a priest of the gods, told me all this, I would have said it was a lie. But I myself heard the voice. I myself saw the god. In matters of religion, in matters of choosing his own life, Priam obeys the gods, but he won't believe what even a priest or prophet tells him the gods have commanded. He'll only believe what he himself has heard the gods telling him in person. I think Zeus knows exactly what he is doing in the dreams he sends to Agamemnon and to Priam. He sends false dreams to those who choose their lives according to measurable and public things like status. And he sends true dreams to those who judge for themselves. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. I'm told I should be able to take questions. I
Is that, am I interpreting you correctly? <laughs> yeah. Please. You have one there. Emily Baker, Washington, D.C. Um, I was struck by, if I heard correctly, uh, the description of Crusades being valued for her height, her mind, and skill. Agamemnon values Agamemnon, her for that, right. not Homer, uh, Agamemnon. And I, height, we can all understand. I assume, and this is the first part of the question, that skill refers here to the traditional skills of a woman in Greek society. But the mind, could you, I'm very struck by that, and I would like to know precisely, um, I, you know, I thought, oh, that's great, but is it so great? What precisely did mind, and what is the Greek word that is used for that? I am a monoglot barbarian, so I don't remember the Greek word that's being used here. I'm sure anyone else in the room can, can say, can tell you. Um, I'm going to get, the skills are definitely feminine skills. In other words, later on in the poem, uh, in, in the funeral games for Achilles, uh, one of the prizes is um, w a woman or worth, I think, four oxen because of her skill in, in weaving. And it's, ent again, entirely measurable in this way. Uh, I don't know what, uh, what mine means. I think it means some measurable, measurable intelligence. I think he's, it's the uh, Sanford Binet scale or something of this sort. That, uh, whatever, whatever was in use then, the Indiana multi-something uh, test, um, but I do, I mean, that, that is the way Agamemnon thinks, and he's always thinking in numerical terms. Later on, for example, he, he says that um, Zeus values uh, Achilles more than whole armies. He's always measuring thing on a scale. So whatever he's talking about is something that is easily compared to someone else. That's, I'm afraid that's the best I can do. Hi, Howard Gardner from Cambridge. Um, you've outline these two different perspectives, one more uh, quantitative and the other more, more personal. Um, do you have a sense, and it's clear which one you like better, um, but do you have a sense um, chronologically um, which emerged earlier? Um, because I mean, there's some arguments that you know, the Odyssey is much more of a psychological uh, track and the Iliad is, is much more you know, the gods pulling all the strings. But and, and do you have any sense yourself very strong. I have a very strong sense of this, um, you know, which is an, op an opinion. Uh, the, in the Iliad, Achilles knows all these things already. I haven't talked about Achilles' judgment. When uh, Achilles uh, says, when Achilles withdraws from the battle because Agamemnon has taken away his, the captive woman, Briseis, and um, the Greeks are in terrible trouble, Agamemnon sends this immensely long list of prizes that he is going to give, uh, that he's going to give to Achilles if he will return to battle. Seven captive women, so forth, and all this, and my own daughter. And Achilles, as he hears this, blows up and says something like, I don't care how many he gives me. I'm going to go home. He does, I don't care how beautiful they are. He says, I'm going to go home and my father will choose a wife for me. And then about three lines later, he, he, he's, you can see his mind moving forwards, saying um, that, that I will, when I go home, not my father will choose me. He says, I will marry a woman, and the, the Greek word is, it's obscure, but it seems to mean something between whom I like, or as Robert Fitzgerald translates it, of congenial mind. In other words, not measurable. And Achilles, over and over again, is, says things like, nothing is more valuable than being alive. This is when he is withdrawn. So the whole, and Achilles, by the way, is the one person who, who plays an instrument with nobody listening. When he withdraws from the battle, he stops caring about measurable and numerical things. And he's thinking his way into, into what it means to be a unique person. In the world of the Iliad, that's doomed. It's, he's not going to succeed. In other words, but Homer already knows in the Iliad what a unique person is, and that is what Achilles tries to be. Um, talking about this to a friend who said, well, Achilles sounds like a, a, a difficult adolescent, an angry adolescent, but of course the, the fact is you don't become a unique person without going through the stage of being an angry adolescent. It is not possible to achieve this without the, the immoderation of going this way. So no, I do think from the very beginning of, of certainly of, of literature from the Greek tradition, that idea of the individual person not measuring, I think the contrast is always between Achilles and Agamemnon. Achilles who knows what it's like to be a unique person, Agamemnon who simply can't imagine such a thing. 
<laughs> yes. <clears throat> Alina Ostreicher, um, New York City. I recall when I first read the Iliad in Fitzgerald's translation when I was a freshman, I was astonished at the subtlety of characterization, um, including, <laughs> including all, all that you've said, but also including a variety of persons and, and behaviors and psychologies that I thought was much greater than those in the Odyssey. Uh, so you've left out Paris, you've left out Hector, you've left, left out Hector's wife, um, and, there, and there's... 20 minutes was how much I was, I was given. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was numerical there, and I think... Uh, to, uh, 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 yeah. At any rate, would, would there be an argument for saying that the Iliad is more subtle in its psychology than the Odyssey? I certainly don't think, I think they are subtle in, in different ways, if you'll allow me to discourse a little bit. The, um, the, the psychological portrait of, of Helen and Menelaus in the Odyssey is staggering. What, what Homer describes is the, the suburban couple in which the wife has come back after eight years and she has to spike the drinks and she is always getting in the answers sooner and they, they tell stories in which one is, um, what do I want to say? Um, I'll just very, very briefly describe how wonderful this psychological portrait is. Odysseus' son Telemachus visits, and um, Helen and Menelaus both tell stories, and uh, Helen tells a story about Odysseus, saying, let me just tell you the wonderful things he did. He came into Troy, and I had long since regretted leaving my, my matchless husband, Menelaus, and, and um, so I helped Odysseus kill Trojans, and I rejoiced while the Trojan women were complaining. And Menelaus listens to this and says, an excellent story, my dear. Very appropriate. Now, Telemachus, let me tell you another story about how wonderful Odysseus was. He says, we were in the Trojan horse, we Greek heroes, when uh, b keeping silent, when Helen, you, my dear, no doubt driven by some god, came up with that handsome man, Diophobos. Paris is already dead. She's found somebody else very, very good looking. And says, and you, no doubt driven by a god, imitated the voices of all the wives of all the Greek heroes inside, so that we were all overwhelmed with longing, and I forget who it was, who was, was about to shout out and get us all killed. But Odysseus covered his mouth, you know, and until a god drew you away. And there they are both telling stories to Telemachus about Odysseus, each one making the point, you know, I, Helen saying, I tried to, I wanted to go back to you. Menelaus saying, yes, but after that you tried to get us killed. This is a social comedy and, and psychological subtlety that seems to me no one has ever, has, no one has ever equaled. Nick Winter from Newtown, Pennsylvania. Even though both of these writings are attributed to the same person, could they come from different eras? And does this in any way reflect on changing ways of human thinking, uh, kind of coming out of the Bronze Age uh, into later periods? Um, there is a huge scholarly tradition that argues one that they that they are not, a, but that they are by di composed by different persons, or composed by, in effect, committees. That they are essentially fragments. There are even scholarly books that will argue that the author of the Odyssey can be demonstrated not to have known anything about the Iliad, which is utter nonsense because he's constantly referring and completing the Iliad. Uh, in, these, in these matters, it seems to me that the opinion you have of whether they're the work of a single author or whether they are, gather, whether they are the product of collectives is not anything that can be confirmed. It's one that which you say who you are. And what I, by saying that I'm utterly convinced that except for miscellaneous lines that came in, these two are so transparently the work of one person thinking morally about the universe. I am not really telling you anything about Homer. I am telling you about my own conviction. Well, the person who says um, that all these are scattered fragments made up, that they have no moral or universal meaning, is basically telling you, I have no moral sense. I simply <laughs> believe that the world is a collection of unrelated fragments, and that is what I see in the book. I can't tell you which of these is right, but I know which one I, I am utterly committed to. 
Annie has given me this familiar sign that she uh, she employs sometimes. Right. So thank you very much. much. My pleasure. I've lost <laughs> the. Uh, thank you. Very